Greetings, I'm Reverend Dr. John E. Jackson, Sr., and I am the Senior Pastor of the Trinity United Church of Christ in Gary, Indiana, where we are not just another church, but we are a culturally conscious, Christ-centered church committed to the community. We are unashamedly Black and unapologetically Christian, and I have with me the uh, esteemed and inimitable uh, nurse par excellence, uh, Marche Taylor. I am honored. I, I am esteemed. It is a joy to have Marche on for this interview. How are you doing, Marche? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. So let's get started. Uh, would, you, would you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Who are you? Who is Marche Taylor? Well, as he said, my name is Marcia Taylor. Mm -hmm. I was um, raised, I was kind of all over the place. I was born in Virginia. Okay. I was raised in Chicago as well as uh, Gary. Okay. Um, I went to Westside Leadership Academy for my high school. And then I went to college at Valparaiso University. I went to a couple colleges, but I graduated from Valparaiso University with my nursing degree, my bachelor of nursing. Um, I am one of three. I'm the middle child. I have an older sister and a younger brother. Okay. Um, what else? What else? What high school you go to? What's that? What's that Leadership Academy? Uh, and I went to Holy Angels Grammar School in Chicago. Okay. So I was kind of all over the place. It's all right. Uh, <laughs> um, that's pretty much it. I, I, um, I work I've been a nurse for almost two years, and I work at Community Hospital in Munster. Wonderful. All right. Well, that 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 allows me the next question. Then, why nursing? What what is it that that um, that drove you to want to be a nurse of all things, and a nurse in the ER? So, a nurse. Period. I've always been one to want to help. I've always been that person that. Oh, I help you with this, or I help you with that. I didn't really take a lot of help, but oh. I offered it a lot. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And uh, and I, my grandmother was sick, not a lo not my whole life, but my grandmother was sick, and I had a sick best friend. She had sickle cell anemia, and those things consistently going to the hospital with my best friend, and um, later in my grandmother's life before she transitioned having to care for her definitely geared me towards being a nurse because I loved being the one that was compassionate and being able to hold her hand during this tra uh, troubling time. And mm -hmm. it's just who I am. Okay. An okay. ER nurse was yeah. kind of going to that uh, I have always loved this. Is not, you're not going to like this, but I always loved the guts and the blood and oh. <laughs> I've always been the one to want to I got you okay. you got bleeding I got you okay um, oh. but outside of that I wanted I, I've always been the person that wanted to be for, there for you at your lowest point and if you come into the emergency room whether it be for a toe pain or um, a cardiac arrest you felt like that you were in that much distress that you had to come into the emergency room. I want to be that person that cares for you and that makes a difference. Wow, that's fascinating, and that is, and that is, um, that is so comforting to know that there are uh, persons like yourself. And so, uh, thank you for sharing that. So let's go into the subject of the day. We are in a global pandemic. Uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. Uh, let me ask a um, couple questions. I guess they're kind of technical. What is the difference in coronavirus and COVID-19, if there's a difference? It's, it's the same thing. So coronavirus has been a, around for a long time, um, but there is different forms of coronavirus, just like different forms of flu. You know, you have influenza A, 
uh-huh. with the swine flu and influenza B. Uh-huh. Um, and so COVID-19 is just another word for coronavirus, such as influenza and flu being interchangeable. Okay. But they've been calling it COVID-19 because of the, that is the virus name. Got you. Okay. So now we're in this global pandemic uh, all over the entire world. People are being infected and affected by this virus. And we have, you know, many of us have watched the news and we see places like New York, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, major cities that are, that seem to, you know, overrun and whatnot. What is it like uh, for you in Northwest Indiana and you're getting, I'm, I assume you're getting more patients than normal. Uh, and so what is that like being in the emergency room and the influx of uh, people coming because of the virus? Um, it's scary. Uh, seeing people, so the thing about this virus is people can turn super fast. It is a 14 day, uh, what's called an incubation period. Uh-huh. Uh, and what that means is, it, sit, it can sit in your body for 14 days before you have any symptoms, which is why it's so important to self-quarantine and, and social distance and stay at home because you, you are out and about and hanging out and kicking it and all of this, and you don't really know that you may be carrying it. You may be the person that infects the next person. The next person may be the, the person that's infecting you. Um, so with that being said, a lot of people come in after the two weeks and they turn really fast. They can be fine when they come in, and then the next moment you turn around and they have a breathing tube down their throat because of the fact that it's not that they stop breathing, it's the fact that they're not getting enough oxygen, uh, so enough oxygen to the brain. And when you don't get enough oxygen to the brain, you, you can stop breathing. Um, and so we try to do supplemental oxygen, such as in your nose or a mask on your face, but sometimes that doesn't help. And so the, the next thing is to put a breathing tube down. Uh, so that is scary just because of the fact that seeing young people, 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 20-year-olds, that's on life support because of this virus is, is, is eye-opening. Uh-huh. So um, what's, what's a normal day like? Because I, uh, I assume you're working 12-hour shifts, right? Yeah. So what's, a, what's, a, what's, what's your day like? You arrive at work, and, and then what? What happens? Uh, I arrive at work. I have to put on a different pair of scrubs instead of my own scrubs. Okay. Um, what's, what's that mean, a different pair? A different- uh, just a hospital pair of scrubs. Okay. So we initially had our regular scrubs, which I didn't really agree with having our regular scrubs on because of the fact that you didn't have to take that home and wash it at home. So uh-huh. then you're taking that virus home because it's not just it's not just um, airborne. It's uh-huh. contact as well. So it can also sit on your clothes. So we have to take those scrubs off and then we take them home. But with the scrubs that they provide, we just keep them in the hospital and they, they just wash them at the hospital. So you would go get a hospital pair of scrubs. Um, you would go get a N95 mask. And for me, me personally, I wear my N95 mask all day long um, because I don't know who has it. I don't know if this person is designated. They came in with shortness of breath and yeah, they may have it, but this person they came in with side pain and they very well may have it as well. So um, I put my N95 mask on, and then there is a mask that goes on top of the N95 mask. So I have on two masks. Wow. Um, I have on a scrub cap. So I put on my scrub cap, and then I, for every patient, I'll put on a hairnet. Um, I get report from the previous nurse, mm-hmm. and then I have to, if it is a, a respiratory room, I have to put on a hairnet on top of my scrub cap. I have to put on shoe booties. Um, I have to put on a a gown. Uh, I normally put on two sets of gloves. Uh-huh. I have to have a disposable stethoscope. Then I go in the room, and you stay in the room for a long time. 
So you can be in the room for, if it's a brand new patient that just came in from the front, which is called triage, uh-huh. you can be in the room for an hour and a half, easy, an with hour. One patient? With one patient. Wow. Because we have to do everything. So um, you try to limit exposure. So we try to do, we do blood work on them. We do EKGs on them. Uh, we ask them all about their history. We get them into the computer, which is what they normally do on the front. But if we have an open room, we do it in the back. Um, if they have a fever, now we have to give them some Tylenol. If they need some oxygen, now we have to put them on oxygen and we just stay in the room until they get better. Uh, if they need an ID, we put them, we put an ID in them. But when we have to get medications, we have to call out into the nursing station to allow a nurse to get all of that stuff for us. Um, if they have to, you know, urinate or we have to be there for all of that. So you can be in the room for an hour, an hour and a half. And then if you do have another patient that is like that, you have to take all of that stuff off and put new stuff on and go do the same thing over again. Oh, my. Um, so how many patients will you see in a day? Will we see in a day or yeah. at a time? So both. So at a time, we can see three patients. We can have up to five, but they try to keep us at three because um, the two other patients is in the hallways. And so they try not to put anybody in the hallways during this time. Um, But uh, in a day, it's kind of hard to tell. So in a day... It's it's hard to it's hard to say because you know you can have a patient downstairs in the ER for a long period of time before they get a bed. Uh-huh. Some, sometimes sometimes it's quick and a lot of times it's not as quick. So you just you're holding onto that patient and so that room is then closed and then that room has to get clean. That room has to wait to get clean for 41 minutes and then they get or wait 41 minutes and then get clean. So it's kind of uh-huh. hard to. It's kind of hard to say how many patients. Um, I'm team lead a lot. And so when I'm team lead, uh, I can see a lot of patients, a lot of them, because I help with each nurse. I see. I see. So, you know, um, patients now come in and they can't have family with them. Mm -hmm. So what is it? What is it like where you're seeing a patient and you know that they want family with them? to help comfort them and things like that. You know, how, how is that, how do, how do you approach it? And then how does it affect you? Um, well, I try to be that person for them. So I keep them informed, the patient. I keep them informed on everything that's going on. Um, if they need to talk to me, then they, they know that they can because I, I come with open arms. So I, I, I come, I'm very approachable. And I try to make that clear when I come in the room that I am very approachable. I put my phone number from my um, my hospital phone. I put that on the board so they can, if they need something. And I so we all pretty much put it on the board. But I also make it clear that if you need something, if you wanna, if you don't wanna press the call line, you need to talk to me directly. Feel free to call that number directly, and it comes directly to my phone. Mm-hmm. Um, and then. Uh, Pretty much, like I said, just try to keep them not in the dark. And on the other side, the family, yeah. I am very clear with them as well. So if, if they had a wife and they came in, then I would call the wife. Normally, the, normally they call in, uh-huh. but I would call the wife. And I normally call when everything's coming back. And I say, you know, this is everything that's going on. This is the plan. Do you have any questions? Do you have any concerns? Uh, and try to address all of those things. And then if they need to talk to a doctor, then I let them talk to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Uh, As far as the way it affects me, um, I mean, it definitely is sad when it comes to, especially like sick people, seeing sick people there by themselves on a ventilator and not having any family. It definitely is, is surreal. Uh, because the family definitely makes a difference. Seeing, you know, when a person comes in into the ER, as my mom was talking about, uh, my mom told me I, I compartmentalize because oh. of the fact that this is my job, I get it done. You know, 
as as I, as we talked before, um, being an ER nurse, you can't dwell in the moment, unfortunately, wow. because of the fact that you know I may walk into one room and that person is like a toe pain, and the next room may be a cardiac arrest, but then the next room may be a a little girl that came in because she had a fever. So I can't go in the next room and just start crying. <laughs> Uh -huh. yeah, we looked that kind of strange. Uh -huh. uh, so, so I say that to say that with a lot of sick patients, what makes it real to me is seeing the family. Seeing the family definitely puts me. Half the time I cry with the family because uh -huh. it it it's heartbreaking. Yeah. And so when you don't have family, it is it is very sad because half the time they're on the phone and they're just crying their eyes out and you have to console them by phone which is wow. heartbreaking wow well wow. what are some of the what are some of the you know when i was a police officer there were situations every police officer had their particular situation that would get to them um is that something that you experienced as a nurse there are particular situations that really make you make you make you want to cry, make you make you so sad, make you, you know, are there particular, you know, uh, I know some police officers, you know, seeing a child abused is something that can send them over the edge. And so, you know, how is that as far as being a nurse? Are there particular situations that really that really get to you? I feel like children abuse is across the board. To me, seeing sick children is is it literally shatters my heart seeing sick children um, that don't have a parent that cares. Okay. I think that that hurts me the most. Um, yeah, children is 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 a whole different ball game because they're innocent, they're vulnerable. Yeah. They don't, you know. Um, but with COVID. What gets to me the most is probably seeing people die alone and not have any family members. Uh, because typically, so we don't actually see, so we start the patient and if they don't die downstairs, which hopefully they don't, hopefully they make it, you know, we stabilize them and we send them upstairs and they stay in the ICU for how many days. People that have been upstairs for weeks. Um, and then we we kind of wait but we almost are like we can't follow them because once we're done in the er you know it's on to the next patient on to the next patient on to the next right. patient but what i typically do is i typically look i don't look in their chart but i look at the, the names to see how well what unit they're on because then you oh, know okay. if they're in a good unit i mean if they're on like a medical unit then they don't have a tube down their throat anymore because it's impossible to be on that unit with a tube down their throat Okay. And so that that gives me peace. That gives me peace to have understanding and being able to push through this to see someone get past this. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask among uh, your your nurse colleagues and 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 healthcare personnel, is there during this crisis oftentimes crisis bonds people together even closer? Have you have you found a closer uh, a closer uh, connection? to the other nurses and, 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 and hospital personnel because of the crisis? Yes. Okay. A, a lot of the um, a lot of the nurses downstairs were already close because we see some gruesome stuff, you know, um, but I think it's been a few nurses that I have bonded with more intimately with this gotcha. happening, as well as um, there's always this, which I don't know why it's like this, but it's like a ER ICU food <laughs> or something like that. Um, and so that has gotten better. Um, well, at least I, I, I never had a few with them, so I can't really say okay. that it's getting better with me. But uh, for example, I wanted them to know that, you know, we're all in this together. So we took some donuts upstairs to ICU. Uh -huh. on a registration or not registration uh respiratory to let them know you know we're all in this together there's not a few just yeah. all yeah 
together. Yeah, yeah, that's all. Oh, yes, the bonds have definitely been created. Yeah. So let me ask you then, on the other end of this, because it seems that, you know, it is, it is a lot of uh, pressure. Um, when you are, when you get off, uh, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you uh, process that and decompress and things like that? What, what is it you do that helps you um, um, build up to be able to endure it and go back in? So one of the things I know I, I do if I had a bad day is I normally cry. But my mom always calls. I like I'm. I've already always been taught a cry baby because I am. Really. <laughs> but I normally, uh, I always say a good cry. All you need is a good cry. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> but um. <laughs> uh, but normally, I, I pray. Um, and then I have different hobbies. I have a weird hobby. I like to clean. You like? To I'm not like. Yeah, I'm not like OCD or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but so I, I'll do different different hobbies. I sit with my dog or things like that to to keep pushing. Um, but I do pray and I keep in mind that they need you. So you, know, you just got to keep pushing, got to keep pushing, got to keep pushing. Yeah. Because yeah. the next person needs you. Yeah. Yeah. What, you know, we get ready to wrap up. What, you know, what do you say to that people are going to be watching this and majority of people that are going to watch this are not nurses. They don't work in hospitals. And we've got, you know, we've got the shelter in place. We, we, we've got social distancing. We've got, you know, the meticulous hand washing. Uh, you know, we've, we've got those things and uh, people are feeling you know, a little stir crazy and things like that. We we got some states, in particular down south, that are looking up, that are looking at uh, relaxing these restrictions. As a nurse, what do you what do you want to say to folk about you know about these the restrictions that we have and people being a little antsy about being in and not being able to do what they want to do and things like that. What do you, what do you as a nurse want to say to? Well, <laughs> I got a feeling what you want to say. <laughs> the restrictions are in place for reasons. They, they, they're not in place to to make people bored or get people annoyed. Or I mean, it is scary, but I think that social distancing, washing your hands, and doing the things that is in place is important because I want people to think about if this was your family, mm. if it was your family that was on a ventilator and it may be your family. Mm -hmm. You may have a person that's, that's um, deceased from this. A lot of people, what I've been hearing a lot of was, it's not like the flu, the flu is worse. The flu, the, the flu killed more people. Yeah, that's a good point. But you, you know, you have to think about it. Yeah, okay, you may look like the flu killed more people, but the flu has also been around for decades. And so when you look at how many people the flu killed versus how many people the coronavirus killed, it's almost, it's, it's not the same, but it's pretty up there. But coronavirus has only been around for a few months. The flu has been around for years. You know, so if you look at it in comparison to that, and take that into account, you feel a little bit different. This just came out of nowhere. We have vaccinations for the flu. We don't have vaccinations right. for coronavirus. Yeah. Um, there are ways that you can prevent from getting the flu. The only way that we can prevent from getting coronavirus is what we have, which is washing your hands and not touching your face and social distancing. I know I get it. You know, a lot of people are like, I finally got a vacation. I can sit at home and I can kick it with my, my friends and I can do this and I can do that. And I know it feels like that because it feels like you feel antsy. You feel mm -hmm. you got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. You know, but the best thing to do is just sit at home. And when you feel like you do need to go, cluster your stuff. So if you 
said, oh, I need to go to Walgreens today to get this, 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 and that. You know, do you need to go grocery shopping? Do you need to uh, go to the bank? Do it all at once. Yeah. And then go back in and stay in. Stay in, yeah. For, for, for a while. You know, just think of the, the way that we're, as healthcare, the way that we are helping everyone in the world and and everybody's calling us superheroes and everything to that extent. Help us be that. Mm. So if we're helping you, then you are helping us by staying at home. You are helping us by washing your hands. You are helping us by so, social distancing. So if you care really about us, then do the precautions that are in place. That's a good point. Good point. I do want to ask you about this thing about math, because um, I've mentioned to you before, you know, I've seen uh, people walking around the street like I was at, uh, I was out and um, I saw a couple of people with N95 masks. And I said, you know, for healthcare personnel, I mean, give me your, give, share your feelings about the mask situation. <laughs> so my feelings of yes, the mask situation <laughs> uh, in a professional way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in N95, you have to be fitted for N95. You have to be mm -hmm. fitted for one. Yeah. Okay. You can't just go around because if you're not fitted for N95 mask, it's like basically walking around with shoes that don't fit you. Mm. You know, you, you need to be you need to be fitted. Some are too small. Some shoes mm -hmm. are too small, and it's going to hurt you. And some shoes are too big. Mm -hmm. So, you know, regardless of the fact it doesn't fit, it's the same thing with N95. If it does not fit, it won't do anything for you. Mm. But waste it. Waste it for everybody that actually needs it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that, you know, if, if you have been fitted for one and you are walking around with one, by all means, if, if you are a healthcare professional and you've been fitted for it, or you may not even be a healthcare professional. You just, you did the proper fitting. Um, and a lot of, a lot of times what they also don't realize is facial hair. You cannot have an N95 and have facial hair. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So if you have facial hair, um, that's why you see a lot of the doctors and a lot of the guy, the male nurses, yeah. or the male techs or whoever, um, they're shaved clean lately because of this, because it doesn't fit properly if you have facial hair. So it bothers me when people are walking around with like facial, full fledged yeah. facial hair with an N95 on. Um, so just a, a surgical mask is sufficient. You don't have to walk around with an N95 mask. Like I said, if, it, if it's not fitted because then you're just wasting supplies and we are on the national shortage. So please keep that in mind. So what about the, the cloth masks that people are making? Uh, so the cloth masks, um, there is certain cloth masks that like have a filter or something in it. So I'm not as, as that entirely familiar with all of the cloth masks. I mean, anything to protect you, that's why you should stay at home. But if you do need to go out, you still should social distance. Because basically it's like putting your hand over your mouth with any mask that you wear, besides the N95, with like any surgical mask or any bandana or anything like that. Um, so you should social distance because I don't know how well those work because um, it may just be fabric and it may be some of them have a filter in it. So the filter, of course, works better than just a, a regular old bandana mask type of thing. Mm -hmm. Um and some of them, I know, like some of them have like that little circle on the mask, and I think yeah. those are filters. Okay. That those masks are better than others, but then you also have to keep in mind some of those masks don't have like a a nose piece where you bend right. because it's a, you have to create a seal. So if you yeah. don't create a seal, it's not really doing anything because it's just it looks like it's protected here, but all of the air is coming in. Ah, uh, which is why way. glasses fall good. Yeah, that's why your glasses fall up, because because you don't have a good seal on them. So you have a good seal on them, and you won't really see your glasses fall up. Okay. So if you do have those masks, any mask is, is fine, but just remember to social distance. Yes. Six feet. Um, a lot of stores that I've been to at least have things on the floor to right to make you social distance. Yes. 
you know, the six feet. Uh, and then that's pretty much it. Gloves. Gloves. Uh, yes. Talk about gloves. <laughs> you should not be walking around with treat your gloves like you treat your hands. So if you're not gonna keep your hands if you're not gonna keep the gloves clean, then don't wear the gloves because it you you're not gonna walk around without gloves on, touching everything, and then go grab your food, right? right. You right. know, so you wouldn't you shouldn't do that with gloves. So if you're in a grocery store, there is really no need for you to put on gloves in a grocery store. Um because once you touch everything, just wash your hands. As long as you don't have any open cuts. Gotcha. So as long as you touch, once you touch everything, once you're done, then wash your hands. What I have been doing is I touch everything and then hand sanitizer. If you don't have access to water and soap, hand sanitizer is sufficient. Uh -huh. um, what I've been doing is just putting one glove on once I get to the register and touching the keypad. Yeah. And then throwing that glove out. Or when I go to the gas station, I'll touch the pump with my glove just because I don't have access to water and soap. Gotcha. So I touch the glove or I have the glove on and then I'll pump my gas and then I throw it out. But basically it's a one touch thing. So if you have that policy, a one touch thing. So if you touch this meat, then it needs to go in the garbage. You shouldn't be touching everything. That's why some stores have in place. You're just contaminating everything. Ah, can you let me ask? Can you uh, can you wash the gloves and reuse them? Um. So if you're in like a store, you don't have access to them. Or access to like uh, like uh, multiple gloves, and you really don't want to take your gloves off, then I guess you can wash them. And, and use them then, but I wouldn't wash them, take them off, and then reuse them again, no. Okay, so you can't, like, you get home, take them off, wash them, and then use them the next day? That's not good? Mm -mm, I oh. wouldn't. Oh. Because, so you're washing the outside of them, but you're not, the inside is still oh. harboring bacteria as well. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So, um, what I did want to mention is yes. something that I, um, I actually shared on Facebook. You know, so we, I mentioned that we compartmentalize as nurses because we just got to get it done. You know, we're here to help you. Um, but this actually says it all. So it says, someday healthcare workers that aren't answering you today will need to talk. They are going to tell you about the patients who die without their families, how their coworkers were getting sick all around them, how women gave birth in masks how they held the hands of their dying patients because no family or visitors were allowed in the hospital, how terrible it was to fear going to work and then going home to their families, how they work with skeleton, skeleton staff in heavy gear or no gear and had to make it through every day hoping not to be exposed. Someday they will need to talk again. They will need you then, but today they need to go to war with COVID-19. Oh so, so that's just something that uh, if you can keep in mind, you know, we may look like, oh, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Um, but, I mean, it does affect us in a, a, a great deal um, because we are at the front line of this, not only just healthcare workers, um, but essential workers. So so by, by staying home, you are helping us. Or, you know, you can always send food to a community ah. hospital. <laughs> That's right. Get that in there. <laughs> Put a nice <knife> shift. <laughs> a nice shift. That's right. Get it. Get it specific. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you so much, Marche. This you you You're are welcome. cool. You are a gift. Uh, you are a blessing. I'm so glad that you are a member of Trinity United Church of Christ in Gary, and I am just ecstatic that you are. Uh, one of the ones on the front line uh, caring for in the ministry and nursing is a ministry in the ministry of nursing. And so thank you again so much for, for joining with thank us for a few you minutes. You are very welcome. And I am Reverend Dr. John E. Jackson, Sr. I'm the senior pastor of the Trinity United Church of Christ in Gary, Indiana. And so I wanna thank Marche for being with us again. I wanna thank you for checking us out via the YouTube page or uh, by our Facebook live page. I'm asking that if you are viewing us by YouTube, 
that you will subscribe to our page. I, if you're watching by Facebook, I ask that you will like our page and check us out on Sunday mornings as we have virtual worship service at 11 a.m. on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. And once again, we thank you. We praise God for you. God bless you. And I am so glad the tomb was empty. Bye, Marche. Bye.